Uh, I'm Jeff Smith. I um, got my doctorate here at Chicago in 1996, studied with Professor Heckman. Uh, my first job was at the University of Western Ontario in exotic London, Canada. My second job was at the University of Maryland, uh, where my physician, the money for my position was raised by one of my friends from graduate school, which is the kind of friend you want to have. Uh, my third job was at the University of Michigan, which I'm just, uh, just finishing now and moving on uh, to Wisconsin. Jim Heckman has um, had a set of uh, phases, in a sense, of intellectual phases in his career. Uh, there was the fertility phase, you know, Jim Walker was, a, was produced during that period. There was the, now there's the early childhood phase. I happened to work with him in the, in the job training program phase. And so my research agenda has sort of taken off from that place. Uh, it has a strong methodological component, that's not surprising. I've uh, thought a lot about social experiments, thought a lot about matching methods in particular. Also done some work after graduate school on regression discontinuity designs. Uh, but the substantive application of most of my work is what the Europeans like to call active labor market programs, which I've come to adopt as a more accurate descriptor than job training programs. Um, and these are programs that try to help poor people or unemployed people uh, get, to, get jobs, basically, or increase their earnings or whatever. And there's much, a vast literature relative to the amount of money that is spent on these programs that tries to estimate their effects and that thinks in a methodological sense about how to estimate their effects and how best to design them and so on and so forth. And I, I find that stuff endlessly fascinating, so I have kept on doing it. I have a second line of research that looks at uh, the effects of university quality on labor market outcomes. Uh, or college quality, if you will, and more recently, the effect of mismatch. So differences between sort of the ability of a student and the quality of the university that they go to. I've written a couple of papers with my student, uh, Nora Dillon, on this, and it's a somewhat tangentious issue. Our most recent paper, circulating working paper form, basically finds that a lot of this policy controversy is probably much ado about nothing that really everybody benefits from college quality. And by the metrics that we look at, everybody benefits about the same. And at least on average, doesn't mean some individuals wouldn't be worse off, but on average, that's what we find. That paper is still uh, looking for a home, but we're working on that. Um, so that line of work has been very rewarding as well. And it's, it's you know, there's a, there's a navel gazing aspect to it since one works at the university, but it's, it's, it's good stuff and fun. Other things I'm working on at the moment, uh, include uh, an evaluation of the Workforce Investment Act, which is the largest federal training program in the U.S. until a year or two ago using administrative data. Uh, the innovation in my paper in that case is to use matched employer-employee data combined with the usual suspect administrative data from state unemployment insurance records and Workforce Investment Act program records. This has two purposes. One purpose is to say, OK, the matched employer employee data set allows us to condition in the context of a strategy that is based on conditional independence assumptions, so selection unobserved variables. It allows us to condition on a bunch of new variables that other papers haven't conditioned on. In particular, we can condition on characteristics of the firms at which the workers worked at before they lost their jobs. Our prior was, so this is co-authored with Harry Holzer and Julia Lane and other people, our prior was that these variables would matter a lot. They'd move the estimates and hopefully reduce residual selection bias that the usual suspect variables had not taken account of. What we found to our surprise was that the estimates basically don't move at all, which was, which I think is an interesting finding. Partly because of that work and partly more generally, I've become more sort of methodologically interested in thinking about conditional independence assumptions and how we should think about them. There are people in economics who sort of deride papers based on conditional independence as being descriptive, right? There's this sort of binary notion of causality lurking out there where there's causal papers and there are descriptive papers. And even if the authors are attempting to be causal, unless they've done a randomized trial or an RD, maybe diff and diff, they don't get to say causal, they just get to be descriptive. And I've kind of come to the conclusion that that's a, not a good way to think about things. Again, motivated in part by my work on the Workforce Investment Act, by other papers in the literature, that we want to think about causality more as a kind of continuous variable, 
rather than as a binary, this is causal, this is not causal kind of variable. But there's a quality of causal um, claims that we can talk about in a coherent way. Another paper that I'm very interested in that I've been working on for a very long time uh, it has a sort of measurement angle, but is again tied into program evaluation, again tied into active labor market programs. And that paper looks at the question of whether if you ask participants in a program whether the program helped them or not, do they know? And the work I've done so far suggests they have no clue. Uh, I find this work super interesting. This is with my student Alex Wally and my graduate school friend Nat Wilcox. Because I, you know, first of all, if, this, if you could figure out how to ask these questions so that people would know, would, get, would give reasonable answers, answers that correlated with impacts calculated in other ways, you could save a huge amount of money. Because uh, impact evaluations are expensive. Asking questions, not so expensive. I also like it because it bridges over into sort of cognitive science, uh, if you will, uh, or survey methodology more narrowly. And I spent a bunch of time with my co-authors thinking about, well, what if you were going to take the literature seriously, literature on asking questions seriously, how would you answer questions like this? Or how would you ask questions like this? Um, no one ever really has. We've been trying to get people to do that. Actually, there's a couple of recent papers that have, have tried to do this. But mostly, the literature just asks questions that if you really knew the literature on asking questions, you would never ask. So I'm very interested in that and other current hobby horse in addition to causal continuousness is that we have mislaid in economics the distinction between the long run and the short run. Uh, so this was brought to my attention. I had a student, uh, Caroline Weber, who wrote some papers on what public finance people call the elasticity of taxable income. Uh, the elasticity of taxable income. And this parameter is really important. You can write down fairly simple applied theory models in which sort of if you know that number, you can tell the welfare costs of this and that and do all kinds of great stuff. So it's a number that people have spent a lot of time trying to get a good estimate of, just like labor economists used to try to get good estimates of the elasticity of labor supply. But the literature, as I consumed it indirectly through my students, seems to, to have, have mislaid the important distinction between the short and the long run. And we would expect this elasticity to be fairly small in the short run, much larger in the long run as people adjust choices that they make about human capital and fiscal capital investments and so on and so forth. I think you can make a parallel point about the literature on the effects of minimum wages that we have very credible, and this, this ties back into the sort of causal credibility argument that we have more credible estimates of the short run elasticity of labor demand for, un, for low skilled labor, the kind of labor that gets the minimum wage, less credible estimates of the long run elasticity, but really the policy relevant parameter is the long run elasticity, not the short run elasticity. Another thing on my mind, I haven't written about this, but I, maybe I will, maybe I won't, uh, and this is something actually that goes back to graduate school a little bit, uh, because it was in graduate school that I first encountered kind of Bayesian or ca Bayesian stuff, either formal Bayesian or casual Bayesian stuff, is all the tangles that we get into worrying about multiple testing and this kind of stuff. But there's, and I'm all in favor of worrying about these things, right? We need to get away from the world where people who are doing some sort of evaluation, you know, gather data on 100 outcomes, present impacts on all 100 outcomes, and say, ah, look, 10 of them are statistically significant at the 10% level. Let's, let's go. Uh, at the same time, there's sort of important conceptual issues that the current way of proceeding that tries to address concerns with sort of simplistic absence of multiple comparisons concerns doesn't deal with, do the multiple comparison concerns only apply within a paper or across papers or within a literature or what? There's a whole bunch of issues there that I think the profession uh, could spend more time on.